Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Deep Thoughts. Today, we're going to expand on an episode I made way back in season one. I think it's like episode 26 or something. It's the Moon Hoax episode. Now, I've had a lot of folks come to me uh, saying, look, love the Moon Hoax episode. You mentioned a little bit of evidence, but you didn't mention the big, gigantic ball of evidence that we didn't go. Now, I need you to know that that ball of evidence changes and, and gets bigger and bigger and bigger every single six months. So I don't have any notes. I never do. So I'm going to wing this just going from the angles that I think they're important. You see, the moon hoax, I think, categorically was not intended. Maybe there were some folks that were deep enough into the rocketry programs and the space programs that they knew that this was going to have to be a hoax from the very beginning. You know, we, we split down the center when it comes to people who believe that either we went to the moon or that we didn't go to the moon. But for the folks that want to believe that we went to the moon, it is a matter of their national pride that keeps them from ingesting the facts about the moon completely. And it is amazing how these individuals will devote their life to making fiction fact just so they don't have to go to sleep at night and realize that their government completely lied to them, probably unintentionally. And I'll explain what that means as we go along here. But America likes to hold its head up high all the time about the fact that we are the last bastion of of societal freedom on this planet. Again, like I said in a previous episode, we're not happy that that's the case, all right? We're not sitting here bragging about it like, oh, you guys are in tyranny. We're not. It's terrifying as an American, okay, to have freedom of speech, which most of you have some concept of that, although I think most of my friends who who grew up in Europe, who live in Europe, who are professionals in Europe, they say we really haven't had the First Amendment in the 60-some years that these guys have been alive. But there's this good illusion that we do. And then he said, uh, well, then there's the second part that we have the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms to protect the first. It ain't for hunting people, right? I don't want to get off into a constitutional thing, but think about it. We in America celebrate the original form of Magna Carta in our Constitution. It has been corrupted, the 16th Amendments and that kind of stuff. 9 11 has gutted pretty much all 10 of the Bill of Rights in some form or fashion. But our country lied. That group, that administration, that, that, those, those folks that went through NASA at the time lied. And we have put a fake flag in our mind on the surface of the moon, which we have never done. And we still say to this day, as a complete lie, that it's up there, that all the Apollo landers are up there, that there's a mirror up there. It's all a bunch of fucking lies. Go to your local bookstore in any country and go to the science section and go look about go look at the uh, the books written about who went to the moon first all those books are lies yet every country on planet earth if they have a book section or bookstore excuse me with the science section there's the huge lie right there in front of your face we have never been to the moon people never ever ever when we accept a lie as truth we seriously injure our version of reality. We seriously injure potentially ever surmounting that goal of getting to the moon. If you tell your kids that we've already been there, well, then they don't want to do it. If we had ever been to the moon, we would have been back three dozen times. We would have cities up there and research centers. We would. Because it only gets easier over time, right? And we did it with a pocket calculator, supposedly, in '69. Horrendous. And once they realized they could lie to us and dupe us, they did two things. One, they claimed to have gone back, you know, six additional attempts, one fail, which is Apollo 13, totaling six to the moon and landed. Supposedly, you have, uh, then you have the fractured version of NASA, which lies about going to Mars, going to all these other planets, Venus, Mercury, sending all these probes out there. Because they realize that out of sight, out of mind means they can steal you blind, rob you blind. 
how do you confirm there's a an orbiter around Mars? You can't. You have to take their word for it. And the second they realized the computer-generated artwork existed and you could make it photo real, they got to they get to rip you off. And the only hub that keeps it alive, there's two. There's NASA which is really responsible for working together with all the other nations to build something that can launch in the sky and get out of your sight. And there's Jack Parsons Laboratory, or as it's renamed now, Jet Propulsion Laboratories, which then completes the lie. They, they claim that they're monitoring the device. And quite frankly, legally, they may actually be completely in the clear because all they're saying is we're going to point instruments this way or we're going to take data from some third party that we have no corporate uh, responsibility for and we're going to process that data and as long as that shadow entity can provide jet propulsion laboratories with the data they don't know anything the wiser it could be beautifully shrouded like that compartmentalized like that so everyone could be operating in complete legality except some little hub of deceit. Now, if you haven't seen the episode on the moon hoax from season one, you, and you think we did go, you might want to stop and watch that first and then come back here so we can get into it. Because this might be extremely frustrating if you don't have the foundation. I'm going to have to repeat myself here a little bit just to kind of put everything into context. But again, we have two... two tracks that have to occur to complete the moon hoax they have to figure out how to try to get there right we have to build a gigantic formidable rocket that the whole world can see launch that is believable in getting to the moon just you have to be able to believe it but the second track is for everything that you can't do physically especially in the 60s where all special effects had to be done in camera you have to find out how are we going to fake this stuff in a camera? And they have multiple camera problems, right? You have all the camera work that's supposed to happen on the moon. You have video camera work that's supposed to be filming Neil Armstrong coming down the back of the Apollo lander. You have videotape inside the capsule on the way there, on the way back. You have Hasselblad shots that are supposed to be taken all over the surface of the moon. You're supposed to bring back moon rocks. You're supposed to show, uh, you're supposed to actually have a bunch of data coming back from those regions from space. So you're going to have to simulate data coming from space. So there was a lot to do. The hoax was a gigantic pain in the ass for, I'm sure, dozens of folks, but not probably hundreds. It was a pain in the ass in the official realm for thousands. Thousands of people were working together to try and build the Saturn V, to try and build a booster rocket that could actually propel this thing away from Earth's gravitational pull. And for you flat earthers, you're going to have to take a, take a back seat and listen to a bunch of globe thinkers here. So where does the whole thing start? I mean, what was the deal? Why do we even say this thing in the first place? Well, Russia and the United States were sort of com- competing for an ideology. Now, Greece has already gone through all this stuff a long time ago. But you had your socialistic, communistic Russia. And then you had the freedom-based democracy of America. Now, I want to give you an analogy for what this was like on a political science level. Now, imagine you're raising a child in a neighborhood. And you know exactly what your child needs to become as successful as possible in the realm that they want to be successful in. You know, it's studying, uh, getting a hobby, practicing a bunch of different things so they can make an educated choice about what where their love is, right? You need to go to college, perhaps. You know, a good school, not a shitty school. And so you got your kid on the right track. And let's just say that that's, uh, for the sake of an American perspective, that's democracy and freedom. But in this neighborhood, there's a pimp or a drug dealer. Probably a drug dealer. The pimp's more of a 70s thing. Drug, dealers, drug dealer's more of an 80s up thing. But there's a drug dealer who drives down the street in a Bentley convertible. Lipstick red. The dude's got a $10,000 suit on. He's got three chicks in the back. 
wearing barely anything. He's smoking a thousand dollar cigar. He's got money sitting in, you know, duffel bags and stuff, leather attaché cases. And your kid just happens to be on the front yard, in the front yard, looking at this dude going by. And he's predatorial, and he looks at your kid, and he says, how'd you like to have some of this? And he gives your kid a bag of dope, and he just says, well, you stand over at that corner right there. When someone drives up, sell them these little bags of crack for 15, 20 bucks, 50 bucks. Get as much as you possibly can, and I'll, I'll drive back around around 7 o'clock tonight, and I'll pay you for your trouble. That was America's perspective of the problem. Democracy was going to college and learning and having hobbies, and communist socialistic Russia was the drug dealer. Move to Russia and all resources will be pulled together. We'll pay for everyone's stuff. Luckily, Khrushchev was unable to make that work, and so it all plummeted. But before we learned that lesson, before we learned how bad off Russia was, the space race was making it look like communistic Russia worked better than democracy. Because if a country can come together and accomplish more in a space program than America can accomplish in a space program, then something's fundamentally better about Russia. We, you know, and the more that we get communist sympathizers that McCarthy was chasing after all throughout the country, from teachers to professors to hidden people, we would have our country just slowly become Russia all by itself. And so they felt it was extremely important to kick Russia's ass in every fucking way possible. To bleed them dry economically, to, to bait them into something that would economically bankrupt them. Right? And the space program was a brilliant way to do it. But Russia was kicking America's ass the entire time in space travel. We still use their rockets to this day. There's a great documentary I'm going to mention a couple times. I'll just say it here. There's a documentary. It's about 50 minutes long on Netflix all about the Russian booster rockets that had developed a method of kind of using a turbo uh, technique of routing exhaust from the combustion chamber back into the actual rocket itself, giving it ultimate uh, thrust superiority. They worked on it until about 1971, 73, and they mothballed. They actually were supposed to destroy all the rockets, all the engines, and this scientist was brilliant enough to have them stored in this warehouse. And there was over uh, several hundred of them, of which now we have purchased from them, and now we use them to boost our rockets, and they are absolutely superior. It's more of a two-to-one conversion. Like our old shitty, our modern ones in 1995 were beat by these ones in 73. So, the story goes is that Werner von Braun, I'll just lightly touch his history, he was the Nazi that was in charge of building the V-1 and V-2 rockets. They're not rockets, really. I mean, they're rockets, but they're really like glorified bombs. They took off from the ground. They had a uh, gyroscope system inside that was just chronologically timed such that when they went up off the coast of Europe, Towards England, they simply just turned in space, boom, hit neighborhoods indiscriminately. And the, the significance there is that when you're in a time of war, there are all these rules of engagement. You don't just go and carpet bomb a neighborhood full of people. That's illegal. You have to stick to industry related to military. Uh, you could bomb roadways and bridges, preferably not while people are crossing. You can bomb any military installation, but you're even today you're not allowed to kill leaders. You're not allowed to tomahawk a leader, even though we tried to do that with Saddam, Saddam Hussein. But the V-1 and V-2 rockets were especially evil because they indiscriminately dropped all over the neighborhoods of London. Like I've said many episodes, there are houses missing in tracks in southern England because that's where a V-1 or V-2 rocket landed. They just had conventional warheads, meaning just TNT sort of warheads that just exploded and threw shrapnel everywhere. So that's the hero, Werner von Braun. He's the one that masterminded this. 
We smuggle him over to the United States of America thanks to the Dulles Brothers. Think of Dulles Airport. That's named after the Dulles Brothers. They smuggled all of the Nazis that came to America, which is about 1,200, through something called, something called Operation Paperclip. Uh, roughly about half of them became uh, rocket scientists. The other half became MK Ultra people, which you need to go watch episode one of season two, and uh, which is 101. You can see all about that. Now, the really acidic Nazis went to Argentina, including Hitler himself. So all the ones that couldn't possibly walk around in America, they all went to Argentina. So that's the foundational person of NASA. Now, the story goes is that in the mid-50s, Werner von Braun wanted to go to Mars. Which, for me, that story sort of is unbelievable because... The moon would be the most obvious choice. The fact that Mars, through a telescope in the mid-50s, was nothing more than a glowing red dot would seem insane, right? You would have to have built some sort of Buck Rogers, driven by people, rocket to get there, and it would have had to have a tremendous amount of fuel, tremendous amount of thrust. It's a definitely a 100-year project, not a 10-year project. But the romantic story is that the White House was the one that actually convinced Werner von Braun to focus on the moon and not Mars. I reported that once as if that was true, and I, I just I think about it now and it seems utterly absurd. Who knows? But we know that by Kennedy's service as president, he announces that in ten years we're gonna reach the we're gonna put a man on the moon and bring him back home safely. It makes me wonder if they could rewind back to that the day of that speech, if they understood the difficulties and problems that was going to cause them, if he would have ever committed to such a thing. I sort of think not. I sort of think they wouldn't have gotten themselves into this pickle. But I think very quickly, either this was announced with the intent to deceive, and it doesn't mean that JFK knew that that was at all what was going to happen. But either they knew they were going to deceive people or they thought they could and it turned out badly. Now, as I reported in my first episode of this subject matter, I believe very quickly they figured out they couldn't go because you had Arthur C. Clarke, a science fiction writer and a gentleman that was also a scientist who was involved in all things super modern in the 60s including inventing the geocentric orbit theory, he approaches Stanley Kubrick and starts getting a fictional track going. Let's make science fiction stuff, first for television, then for movies. Because Stanley turned him down flat for a television series, and so he said, fine, we'll go, get, we'll go write a movie instead, and MGM will be our folks. They're going to give us a landmark amount of money for this movie. On the scientific side, obviously, everything rushed into full effect. We needed to catch up to the Russians because they were doing a tremendous amount of everything. First satellite in space, for man, first man in space, woman in space, uh, dual missions in space. I mean, everything that they were doing, we thought they were doing, and we thought that they were first. There's a lot of evidence since I recorded the first Moon Hoax episode that the Russians actually were faking most of their orbital missions as well, using various projection techniques, and stop frame animation. Just like they did, uh, you know, King Kong back in the 30s with the model and a rig inside. If you watch the very first animations of a man in space from Russia, you'll notice that it is pretty silly in its frame rate. And we didn't have any frame rate issues. It wasn't like we were filming, filming that with Charlie Chaplin cameras. But they say there was reason why it looked like it was... Uh, Undercranked, which means moving really fast, was that it was stop frame animation and they weren't very good at it. Plus, there's a lot of just jumpy frames. The, the human body was moving a lot quicker than it normally would have. So, there's that evidence uh, suggesting that they actually faked it. We know that they have faked missions in orbit. They have declassified that. So, they actually have, I forgot the Russian guy's name. It's a Russian name. But he was said to have gone into space. He didn't want to fake it. They made him fake it. They made him run around and do, you know, ticker tape parade stuff. And uh, eventually had to reveal that he never went up there. 
But we launched a shit ton of rockets, didn't we? We watched it. We watched the Russians do it. We were doing it. So where does the evidence begin that we didn't go? Because that's what this episode's all about. It's the moon hoax evidence. Now, for everything I'm going to mention, there is someone out there hugging a teddy bear with a very loose description as to why what I'm about to mention isn't actually a hoax. And my interpretation and everyone else's interpretation of this evidence is actually inaccurate. That we're not scientific enough to discuss these subjects. But I will tell you the lunacy of the people that hang on to this stuff, okay? Some guy told me that the, um, the Apollo 11 capsule did not have a round window. Just vehemently in the comments section, as he posted 35 comments in a row, which I had to get rid of him because he was just clogging the entire conversation. And, you know, you just go up and you look up the Apollo 11 capsule. You look up the, uh, the door that was going to have that had the blast bolts on it, which the astronauts were going to use to get the fuck out of there. And it has a round window in it. Because the other windows were round rectangle. It absolutely does have a round window. But this guy was incapable of looking up on Google the most basic photographs of the anatomy of the capsule. But he's so justified in his butt hurt, like the entire world is right now, right? Now, if you haven't watched the first episode on this, I need to tell you something, uh, which is that I was debriefed in 1991 by two NASA, I guess you could call them uh, scientists, astrophysicists, who worked uh, from NASA, worked for NASA from 76 to 88, and from the early 80s into the, about 1990. And they completely debriefed me that we did not go to the moon and that when they were assigned to the Mars mission, their very first attempt to get information about how to get to Mars was to get all the blueprints for how we went to the moon. He says that was the most basic thing. And when they continually searched, and one of the kids was a, one of the guys was, it's about 30 years old, prodigy child, I've been working for NASA from the age of 16 up. He has seven patents at NASA for various uh, technologies. He's now created one of the most name brand products we use on the web. He said that someone pulled him aside and said, look, we didn't go to the moon. Really sorry. You're not going to find this information, so please stop looking. You have a couple choices here. Leave or stay here and work on the Mars mission and take money and be famous. Maybe it happens in your lifetime. Maybe it doesn't. But take your money and shut up. Then on two separate occasions outside of that, over the course of the next 20 years, I have had top clearance NASA people right in front of me sitting at uh, a dinner table randomly placed in front of me because they were friends of friends and someone said you two guys need to talk I then very graciously brought up the the moon mission or the moon missions their first their first uh, responses were to call me names but to do it kind of in a third-party way, well, anyone who doesn't believe that's a fucking lunatic, ba ba ba. And then I let them get it out of their system, and then within the next 60 seconds, I hit them with enough science that they went, well, yeah, I guess you're right. So I've had three, three different encounters with NASA scientists, the very first one having two people present. So I've had four NASA scientists with absolute top clearance. Can't tell me what they do for a living. Basically admit that we didn't go to the moon. And the last two guys were actually pretty funny because once we got through the eye of the needle of horse shit, it was a funny conversation about how we didn't go to the moon. And it was also a conversation of, but isn't it amazing how they convinced everybody that we did? So there's a lot of great things that came out of these fake moon missions that have helped humanity in several ways, if nothing else, just ending this war between Russia and the United States, preserving freedom, which now Russia absolutely loves democracy at this point. They love capitalism. So you guys are like, shut up and get to the evidence already. It's important that when you talk to your friends about this subject matter that you sort of do what I just did. I just spent roughly 30 minutes building this thing up. The problem is, is if you sit down in a conversation and you just start going right at the jugular of all the evidence, you're going to lose. 
you have to remind people what was at stake at the time, where we were as a society from communism versus democracy, freedom, right? You got to remind them who Werner von Braun was. You know, the Aesop fable of the boy they call Wolf. Well, there's a reason why the story was written. People who lie, you do not trust. So there's so much to cover here. I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible. But we're going to have to give this um, enough time to talk about it. The booster rockets are your number one problem for the United States of America. Russia's booster rockets, as I mentioned, were superior. Now, Russia hadn't perfected this uh, this sort of turbo exhaust design. But America had incubated up several boosters. And America's technique was to use several smaller boosters and achieve the sort of escape velocity of Earth. Whereas Russia was, uh, they were trying to use stronger rockets, fewer rocket engines to achieve the same thing. By the time of Apollo 11, we had a classified rocket engine called the F-1 booster. Okay. Your first easy piece of evidence that this is all a hoax is that the F-1 booster rocket schematic has never been released to the public. Now, that's 47 years ago as of this recording. 47-year-old engine is still classified to this day. When my friends who work for NASA tried to go and get that schematic, NASA said they lost it. Right? You still have people on planet Earth that remember working on the thing. And no one's capable of reconstructing the blueprint. You have to understand that there's a, uh, there was a Star Trek motion picture released in 1979. One of my good friends worked on it. Actually, two of my good friends worked on that movie. But one of them worked on the actual Enterprise model, which is about 10 feet long. There's a, there's a, a, a GoFundMe or whatever the fuck you call that stuff. There's a program on the internet to fund the reconstruction of the first Star Trek ship in the first Star Trek movie. To rebuild one from scratch. That's just Hollywood working together to recreate an icon of, of great Star Trek importance. But no one is willing to reconstruct the blueprints of the Saturn V and the F-1 boosters when it is tantamount to discovering fire and the wheel. Getting to the moon is the third thing that is the most amazing thing that man would have ever accomplished. The utter shrine that man should have for the moon mission should be utter and complete. It should be absolute in its ability to reconstruct the mission. But there have been no attempts to do so, because to do so today is a little bit tougher. Why is that? Because we have engineering software now. You realize that Boeing builds jets inside computers for years and years and years, and they stress test it and they flight test, flight test it inside simulation software before they put one piece of metal inside of a machine to actually build the thing. Because we have super duper accurate engineering software. And if they say the F-1 booster works like this and creates X amount of thrust, you have to prove it. Kids in high school, nerds in high school could launch software and prove that the F-1 booster rocket either would work or wouldn't work. But they know it wouldn't work, and so they don't publish it. So there you go. Your propulsion system at the bottom of the Saturn V rocket is shrouded in complete mystery. Schools tell children that we've lost the recipe to go to the moon. Exactly what they told my friends in the late 80s. But let's just... We know a rocket took off, right? The Saturn V took off and went into space, right? Now what's unclear is whether or not the payload in the Saturn V stayed in low orbit. We know they were in low orbit taking photographs of Earth using a magnifying lens of a round window. Go see the movie Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon and you will see several clips from a 54 minute movie demonstrating how they did this. And you'll have people who watch the, watch the video and actually claim that you're not seeing what you're seeing. Don't let cognitive dissonance fuck with your brain. What you are seeing is exactly what Bart Sebrell said you're seeing. I have sat and watched all 54 minutes of that video on YouTube. It is now sort of difficult to find on YouTube. But that's not really the 
smoking. I mean, it is a smoking gun that we didn't go because they filmed everything in chronological reverse order, meaning that uh, if you're not familiar with this, we took movies of the Earth as supposedly we're going towards the moon and then reversed it when we were coming back. Okay, I think the only surviving footage is supposed to be uh, exiting Earth's orbit. Instead of just putting the camera against the window and filming the Earth getting smaller as it goes away, they actually filmed across the cabin of the capsule towards a round window that had a very big fisheye lens in it. And then they, what they did was they filmed, filmed it from making it look like the Earth was really far away, and then they kept inch, inching the camera closer to the window to make the Earth get bigger and bigger, all stamped by atomic clocks, all being transmitted down to the surface of the Earth to be recorded. Only 60 seconds of the footage was ever fil- ever broadcast one time. But the hoax was that they were actually filming a window. While Neil Armstrong on, on camera, on audio, was saying, all this black space around the Earth is space. No stars, of course. And, and they blame it on aperture settings, which is uh, only true in part. But the problem is, is that they were perfecting the shots, so they did the faraway shots first and the closer shots second. Well, stamped on the atomic clock, they would have been really close to Earth at the beginning, and they were going away from it as time passed. The problem is the footage is in complete chronological, chronological reverse order because they were perfecting the shot. They also put a gel on the window to simulate the daylight border of where the sun was shining on the Earth, which also has serious problems. But let's go back to the launch. They launch this thing out of sight, out of mind. They launch it right over the ocean. At that point, you have a couple things that could occur. One, there are no astronauts in the Saturn V. They could have been smuggled down the, uh, the launch platform. Doesn't really matter. When they fell out of the sky at the end of the mission, it could have been simply a capsule thrown out of the back of a plane with a parachute. Splash, pick them up, there you go. But it does look like they were in low orbit. Does not look like they were in some high-altitude U-2 plane flying around taking photographs. It looks like they were in that capsule. So it looks like to me that they had flown up probably about 200 miles up in the sky, which is our previous orbital uh, apex that we were able to achieve. Took a bunch of fake shots of the Earth through this window. I mean real shots of the Earth through a window, but faking that they're achieving some sort of orbital capability or exiting orbital capability to get to the moon. They even made reference that the technique, made reference in the video on record, that it was really brilliant how this technique was mastered in Apollo 10, this faking of the window shot. It's brilliant. It's utterly brilliant how they did this. But now the entire world was supposedly tracking the mission. And because the Earth rotates um, and the mission's going in a straight line towards the uh, towards the moon once it supposedly slingshots off the uh, Earth's gravity, which I think is horse shit. They said, well, that's proof. There's proof because we tracked the telemetry from space. Well, the hoax is based on a rocket that put a, a satellite into space several months before the actual launch to test out the entire logistical responsibilities of everyone on the ground. So this thing is launched into space, and it fakes all the data coming down from what would be the capsule and the lunar modules and stuff once they get into the real mission. And no one thought twice about the idea that they could either launch a new rocket with new data on it without anyone knowing about it, or reprogram the one that's up there in space, in orbit. Such that the time that we're supposed to be going to the moon, the only thing you're tracking is a fake satellite or sorry, a real satellite in orbit around Earth, beaming down fake information about where these vehicles are in space. That's the way it was done. That keeps 99% of everyone participating in the moon launch and the moon hoax believing that we actually went there. They're not lying. They will pass lie detector tests. The old theory, well, I don't see how they could keep this, uh, you know, everybody lying about this. Well, they don't have to. Most everyone in the world, including the Russians, think we win. Maybe the Russians knew, but they had already lied so much to their own people. Maybe America had the photographs, you know, the proof that uh, they said, look, we won't tell your people that you lied and you won't tell people that we lied and we'll end this stupid thing. 
I happen to think that the Russians were pretty cool people and actually believed it. I think that the brass in Russia believed that we made it there. But I don't know everything that was published in Russia. Maybe they have books saying right after it happened that this is all fake. I don't know. But here goes the, uh, the narrative. The narrative is that, that this Saturn V launches. It is scientifically incapable of exiting Earth's orbit. Werner von Braun had lamented about the fact that these booster rockets never really reached the level of thrust that they needed. Several other scientists said the same thing. Gus Grissom, who was murdered on the tarmac, I believe in 65, from the Apollo 1 test launch, when a switch was replaced the day before. The switch was designed to create a spark in a fully oxygenated cabin. It killed Gus Grissom and his two astronaut partners because Gus was going to... Gus had said that it thing would that none of this was actually ready to go to the moon, that it would never make it there. And he was going to hold a press conference after that particular test launch and tell the world that it was a big lemon. Gus got murdered. It's the first death that we know about related to exposing the hoax, right? Now, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that think that they knew more than Gus Grissom. I think it's funny that people will say, oh, yeah, I know more about the... Uh, the the mission to the moon than Gus did when he's the first astronaut that was supposed to step on the moon. It wasn't supposed to be Neil Armstrong. It was supposed to be Gus Grissom. Remember that. This guy was privy to everything, and he said it wouldn't work. But here go these two vehicles attached to each other towards the moon. There's the capsule, which looks like a cone that everyone's actually sitting in, and then there's the module the lunar module that's actually going to land on the moon, attached to the tip. Let's look at the lunar module, because the lunar module has become the smoking gun for me that this thing never happened. But there's so many smoking guns now, it's almost ridiculous that anyone would have to debate such a thing. But you've seen it. It's the sort of four-legged vehicle that lands on the moon with a little habitation capsule at the top. It's covered in tin foil and what looks like cardboard, has a supposedly a 10,000 pound thrust engine at the bottom. Let's just, let's just keep our brain on the, uh, on that module. And let's remember the footage that they broadcast us to prove that this thing actually did what they said it did. So here comes the lunar lander and it's landing on the moon. And there's footage outside the window of the 10,000 pound thrust engine blasting a bunch of debris away from the moon. You can see that footage. You've seen it a hundred times if you've had any interest in this whatsoever. But as soon as it lands and they start taking photographs of this thing on the moon's surface, they have a screw up. No one was able to simulate nor even attempt to simulate the dust that had moved out of the way. And 10,000 pound thrust engine at one sixth gravity would make a massive imprint on the surface of the moon. It just would. You watched it happen. The photographic proof that this didn't occur and that the lunar lander was actually craned down to the surface of a fake moon surface was that all the legs, all the little foot, you know, this, these uh, gold or copper, you know, encased feet didn't have a single speck of dust on them. When we look at the astronauts who have jumped around on this surface that they created, this stuff is sticking to their bodies like, you know, mud on boots. So there's no way in hell that they moved metric tons of this stuff with the 10,000 pound thrust engine and it didn't stick to the side of the vehicle because the astronauts proved that's what happens when you touch this stuff. It sticks to you. Now there's a bunch of butthurt people that talk about how, well, the atmosphere's different and it just probably didn't, you know, this, that, and the other thing. No, it would have. I'm really sorry. It would have. As a matter of fact, there's debris underneath the actual 10,000 pound thrust engine that's just sitting there that would have been blasted away. But let me, uh, let me take you back because to this landing because there's another piece of evidence right in front of your face that you never hear disputed. Now, how many of you are familiar with the space shuttle program? 
Space Shuttle program has two booster rockets, and then it has a central fuel tank, which then feeds fuel to the three uh, thrusters or rocket engines on the back of the shuttle itself, a little triangle formation. Now, you either have solid propellant that burns, or you have a mixture propellant, which is usually um, hydrogen and liquid oxygen, liquid oxygen used to create combustion in a vacuum. And you mix it with hydrogen, which is very flammable, and you get a rocket engine. Now, I want you to look at any photograph you've ever heard in, ever seen in your brain, heard, huh, that you've ever seen where the lunar lander's on the surface of the moon. Just put that in your brain. 10,000-pound thrust engine. I'm going to ask you guys a rhetorical question. How much propellant do you think it would take to run a 10,000-pound thrust engine for any length of time whatsoever? And then I want you to look up on Google, look up uh, a rocket engine from the 60s, be it American-made, be it Russian-made. And I want you to look at the fact that every rocket engine on planet Earth has to have a very intricate combustion system above the actual cone. The unit that goes above the cone to create this combustion technique is massive. It is taller than the cone itself by almost an order of two and a half. So if you were to take any rocket engine that had been invented on planet Earth in 1969 and overlay it on top of the lunar lander, you have so much rocket combustion engine chambers space being consumed that the engine would actually go up through the center of the lunar lander itself. There would be no space for human beings just to put the most primitive rocket on the bottom of that thing. For those of you who are car buffs, let's just give you an analogy so you'll understand this. What you're looking at with the lunar lander is an exhaust pipe. The cone at the bottom is the exhaust pipe. It's not a muffler. It's just the, the tail end of the exhaust pipe that comes out from underneath your rear bumper. And they're telling you that there's a, I don't know, a V8 under the hood. You know, they're telling you it's a 429 blown Hemi underneath the hood. But the problem is, when you look at it, there's no room for the engine because the engine is the environmental capsule for the actual astronauts to be in. And there's this little kind of square base, but that's got the oxygen in it that has all the things that the astronauts are going to be using, plus the sort of storage for um, a bunch of their stuff, like the Chrysler they took up in the second mission, right? So NASA certified there's no fuel in that bottom section. And how much fuel would you need? You'd need a shit ton of fuel to make a booster rocket fire f at all. A shit ton of fuel. There's no space for the combustion unit that would go on top of the cone, and there's no room for any fuel to make that thing do anything more than spit for a split second. But they make you believe that that rocket fired and fired and fired and then created a nice soft landing. So the lunar lander itself is a gigantic sore for them. But I haven't heard a single moon conspiracy person or hoax person itemize the fact that the rocket engine would take more space than the lunar module occupied. Just go look up any rocket engine. I'm telling you, you'll see it in two seconds. It is absolutely painfully evident that that vehicle could not have participated in this particular mission. But now something else occurred. People eventually, in the last decade here, in fact, I think they started in the 70s, started to examine the actual lunar module and all of its doors to get an astronaut in and out of the vehicle. They started studying the actual environmental suits that the astronauts had to wear to survive the conditions of going down to the moon. Now the astronauts are almost three foot thick by the time they put that backpack on, by the time they inflate their suits. They're, they're massive human beings, they're like little robots, but they're inside. Well the problem is, is that the doors to get in and out of the lunar module are so utterly tiny that there's no way that the astronauts could have gotten in there and there's no way that the astronauts could have exited the vehicle over and over and over. It's physically impossible. 
It's like when the dog takes the stick, you know, and he's got the stick in his mouth and he tries to run through the front door of the house or the back door of the house and he slams both sides and he can't figure out what the hell just happened. His teeth hurt. That's exactly what would have happened had any of the astronauts inflated their suits, put them on and tried to get out of the, the hole. And I believe it was a nephew of one of the astronauts that went to the moon who asked, asked to, to have access to one of the lunar module replicants in a museum in Florida. And he just brought a measuring tape with him. He didn't tell him what he was going to do. But he said, can I get closer to this thing? And of course, they don't just have a museum curator handling him. They have someone who has been informed, don't let him get any information from this lunar module that would prove that we didn't go. Like, steer him away. And I don't think they thought he was a conspiracy theorist. I think they just thought he's taking close looks because that's a huge liability to the story of America. The guy's guiding him away from things. This guy's been totally debriefed. Now, the nephew immediately measured the doors. And once he confirmed on video that these doors were way smaller, he started mentioning it because he had what he needed. It wasn't, they weren't going to be able to take away his measurement once he took it. And they very quickly threw him out of the museum and denied him any access, any further access to the lunar lander. Another gigantic smoking gun. And this stuff is barely ever discussed, right? Now, one of the other things that happened around 1999, 2000, was that there was a clip revealed on YouTube very quickly. And again, the second that YouTube came out, you have gentlemen who have been waiting 30 years to put their evidence online so everyone can tell that we didn't go. But there was a piece of evidence, I think you could probably still find it, but it was uh, someone rehearsing Neil Armstrong's exit off the lunar lander and taking his first step on the moon and a light fixture from up above broke and it swung down and almost hit the astronaut and the astronaut kind of looks at the camera like what the hell man and a bunch of guys dressed in full 60s clothing with all the headgear rushed in and were taking care of him now I was working at Electronic Arts at the time I remember looking at this going whoa and I I had been debriefed at that time, but still wasn't really into believing it just yet. But now that I look back, it was brilliant what they ended up doing with this leak. So this footage is leaked, and the intelligence agency swooped in to cover. And they said it was a hoax video made by a director. The, the, the footage claiming it was a hoax was a hoax. And then all of a sudden, by the time you look up this person, the director was already dead. Which you might go, oh God, they killed somebody. Eh, maybe. I doubt they did. I think they just took a character, maybe it already passed and said he was a director, put him on this project. And the idea is you couldn't interview the people who actually participated in creating this footage because it was a hoax and he's dead now. And so it's all over, folks. What you saw wasn't real. Don't believe it. Move on. But what you saw was real. And it was test footage from that day, from the day that they were trying to shoot footage to fake things. And again, they shot all this footage way ahead of time. It wasn't like they were trying to do it live on TV. Not at all. But now remember, there was a video camera inside the lunar module on the way to the moon that was in color. Michael Collins was using the camera. That's what they used to fake the, the images of Earth going away from the module. Again, in reverse order. It was in color. It wasn't 4K, but it was pretty good. But what is the footage of Neil Armstrong descending down the outside of the lunar lander? Well, what they said was that there was a camera attached to the leg of one of the of the lunar lander and that it was shooting the other leg of the lunar lander, and that's how Neil came down the stairs. Now, let's rewind here. This is tantamount to discovering fire, to discovering the wheel maybe to achieving flight in general. And the only footage that's taken of Neil Armstrong putting his foot on the moon was in grainy black and white. Grainy black and white, but there's a color camera inside the vehicle. Why not take the color camera and put it on the outside? Why not shoot it through the window? Why not have multiple shots of this happening? Because it was fake. 
The grainy camera is a defense mechanism to ensure that all the details of every frame of the event couldn't be scrutinized. As it was broadcast to the American people, NASA took the feed from some remote source that is still to be revealed, broadcast it on a white wall inside NASA's command center, and the networks had to film the wall at NASA and broadcast it to the people. So it wasn't a direct feed. No one was allowed to have the direct feed because that would reveal a land-to-land broadcast. Uh, Being a technical person myself, I'm willing to bet that it would have also revealed the signal encoding that would suggest that it was coming from some sort of playback device. But that's just a hunch. So now we're on the moon. Where does the evidence begin here? Well, I mentioned several pieces of this in my first episode, but let's just get into some further details and let me talk about some of the evidence that I try to lean away from. It may be evidence, but it's hard to... It's it's easy for them to play with your mind. Neil Armstrong was the guy that took all the photographs you saw from Apollo 11. The way that the photographs were taken is that he had a Hasselblad camera essentially welded to his chest on the outside of his suit. And for those of you who have dealt with Hasselblad cameras. I grew up my entire life with Hasselblad cameras. I've probably taken a thousand photographs myself with these cameras. But they're the cameras that you see at really high-end modeling agencies. They're now all digital. But you have to look down into the top of it. It has a 120 uh, millimeter negative, which is largely square. Super high resolution. And you You're looking down into it, and it's obviously looking straight. You pop it, it has a very classic shutter noise. And then you have to crank it, and it goes to the next next frame. This is back in the day. This camera has some anomalies in itself, because according to NASA's own information, being in a shadow on the moon is below zero by several degrees. Being in the light on the moon, you're several degrees in the Fahrenheit triple digits. So this camera would be swinging triple digits negative Fahrenheit, triple digits positive in Fahrenheit. That would wreak havoc on all the metal and all the parts inside the camera. Now again, the only person who's ever told me that there was uh, special provisions made for the camera was my father who said that they made special lubrication for the camera to help with this process. But I've seen an interview with the gentleman who built the cameras for the moon, the guy who built the Hasselblads. Now, Hasselblads were rumored to take about a year to build because they're such precise pieces of construction. It's like building the first Swiss watches before you know machines could help. But they asked this guy about the temperature change issues, and they said, well, did you put any provisions in the camera to make sure that it could survive these giant you know, variations in heat? And the guy immediately said, no, huh? He goes, well, what would happen to your camera if it went 250 negative, 250 positive? And he said, just, he said, you know, just a 100 degrees positive negative would totally shatter the machine. It would warp and stop working. He goes, plus any moisture inside the camera would start to uh, show up in your negatives. It would start to blister and, um, you know, gain moisture inside the, inside the camera itself. So with just that interview, the cameras wouldn't be possible to exist on the moon for any any length of time, a couple seconds before they would seize up and cease to work. However, Neil Armstrong, having about a, I think they, I think the the film is supposed to be about thirty exposures per film, was able to take one hundred percent perfect photographs of everything on the moon. His photographs are have all been the covers of the books that you see about the moon hoax. There are the photographs in Time magazine, Life magazine, every magazine you've ever seen in your entire life are the photographs that Neil Armstrong took. All without being able to stare down into the camera. So he just sort of attached the camera and just moved around and goes, hey, let's just take a photograph. Boom, 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 boom. And they're all perfect. Now having a father who was a professional photographer my entire life, I guarantee you that's a physical impossibility. The number one institute in America for photography that I'm aware of is the Brooks Institute. You could take every Ph.D. level Brooks Institute graduate 
put Hasselblad on their chest and send them to any theme park and there's no way they're going to come up with 30 out of 30 perfect shots. And they're trained and they have an eye and they know composition. The only defense I've ever heard was that Neil was trained to take great pictures. No exposure problems, no fingers in the front of the lens, no problem with all that dust that was sticking to their bodies getting on the lens. Nope, everything was... Now the camera shots themselves have tremendous telltale signs of manipulation. For those of you who aren't familiar with counterfeiting, counterfeiting was done back in the day by taking photographs of money and using razor blades at really high resolution negative levels like microscopic level and cutting out various elements to create all the elements of a perfect forgery of money and then putting that through a multi-step print process to create fake money. That was then rolled up into our intelligence agencies to create fake photographs where you could actually put someone's head on someone else's body like Lee Harvey Oswald's picture of him holding the newspaper and the, and the gun. They cut and paste his head on someone else's head. The shadows don't work from his face to his body, but it's a unified light source, right? So this technique was well, well oiled by the time they assassinated JFK. So fast forward six years, and you're using it to create amazing photographs of astronauts all over the moon. So inside the Hasselblads, they had put a glass slate inside the aperture that was going to be imprinted on all the photographs which has all the registry marks the plus signs that allows them to stitch things together and find out scale and what have you it's a brilliant idea absolutely brilliant idea if we ever went there we'd probably want to continue with that sort of strategy but the problem is is that there were so much razor blading and overlaying that they made a lot of mistakes with these registry marks now, back in the day, the excuse was that uh, these registry marks would disappear due to exposure. But that's not possible because light, even though it travels like a wave, is not going to be able to overcome a light blockage mechanism inside the camera. If the plus sign was way out there in front of your face, 20 feet out, sure, light would be able to bend around it and it would make some of these plus signs disappear or certain edges of the plus signs disappear. But this is all built into the camera. They simply couldn't razor blade infinitely small lines out of negatives. That's the reason why it's that way. Now, the one piece of evidence that I think is real for many reasons, but is not something I would ever try to argue with anyone, are the shadows on the moon during most of the photography. Now, when you have the light from the sun creating shadows in your world, all of the shadows are parallel because the sun is so far away, regardless of what you believe, that shadows don't converge. Converging shadows is an anomaly of a light source that's very close to the actual object that's casting the shadow. I work in 3D, 3D software and virtual reality, and believe me, I know this for a fact. Okay, Your problem disputing the shadows on the moon's surface is that the moon is curved. It's not that big. And... There, obviously, the real moon surface has um, tremendous damage from meteorites, from just its developmental process. And so I would never try to dispute the shadow convergence evidence simply because you don't want to argue with someone about the contour of the surface in a particular shot. There's, there's far more evidence that it's a fake to dispute that kind of stuff. So I would just let that one go. There are rocks on the moon tons of rocks and there's the there is significant evidence that these the bigger rocks are paper mache paper mache excuse me um rocks and because it's it's just a gray thing it doesn't have to have any you know geological uh coloring which we could easily do today in 3d software of course right remember the movie martian was made inside a product called terrigen terrigen can simulate any planetary surface, including Earth, photo, photo reel, and there's nothing you can do to tell the difference. But there was a rock that had a C on it. And the idea was that the, the rock had designation for its size, and someone was writing on every one of the rocks uh, some alphanumeric indicator as to put the A's here, put the C's there, the B's there. I personally do not believe that's the case. I believe the rock 
shows that it has a paper mache um, attribute to it, which is a folded corner, which geologists say is not a natural formation. I mean, anything can happen in space, but this has a definite look of being artificial. But NASA's official excuse for the sea, I believe, is more believable having been in a world of photography for at least the first 16 years of my life, which is that a hair got inside the exposure of the negative uh, once they brought it back to Earth and exposed the actual negative paper. It would not have been on the moon if they were there. It wouldn't have been on the set. It would have been in the post-processing of the actual photograph. And it's since been removed. Maybe it was real. It is fairly symmetrical C, but uh, it looks like a short hair off a human body. That's what it looks like to me. So I wouldn't wor worry too much about the C on the rock as much as the corner that looks like it's paper mache. Now, let's rewind a little bit, and this is not exactly a smoking gun, but it's actually, it's just evidence of a forgery. Now, the problem with this whole thing would be that you would have the astronauts in orbit around Earth, and they were not going to be able to participate in any ground simulation of the claims that we've been on the moon. So all the footage coming from the moon would have to be either orchestrated live in some studio or pre-recorded, which is what I think it would be, in some set. Now, if they were smart, they would have, I think, used the astronauts to create the actual footage, but the astronauts were always in sight, right? The astronauts were always at home, going to tests, talking at speeches and stuff, so having them disappear for several weeks prior to the moon launch would have been evidence that we could have tracked. And so in my opinion, I believe that they simulated all the footage of the moon in a set. And let's not forget that Stanley Kubrick rented the set of 2001 A Space Odyssey to Henry Kissinger, of all people, who I don't believe they used that set as the final product. I think they were practicing. But Henry Kissinger was shooting for... Um, they said he wanted it for a couple weeks, and then they were going over. They went, I guess, a month into it, and Stanley told his wife, look, I'm going to go down and finish these shots because I need these guys off my set because I need to use that soundstage for other stuff. And then he tore up all of his sets so no one could ever use his sets in future movies, right? But here's uh, one little thing to remember. If the astronauts, you know, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, the only two people to actually touch. Michael Collins is supposedly in the uh, the orbiter taking photographs of the moon. But if these two gentlemen were down there, then they, you, would, you would be able to see them through some sort of face shield, right? But all the face shields were laminated in gold, gold-plated, and um, you couldn't see into the actual outfit. So anytime you see an astronaut on the moon, you never saw their face on the moon at the same exact time. Now, their excuse was that the sun was so bright that they created this reflective shield on the glass such that it would reflect most of the light. Now, the thing is, is that's an extra shield on top of glass, right? You could have one of the astronauts turn around with his back to the sun, pull that shield up, and have a picture taken of him. Easily. Never happened. Why? Because these are actors inside the suits. So, let's talk about the astronauts jumping around on the moon. It looks pretty slow-mo, doesn't it? It looks pretty convincing. Well, there's a term in Hollywood called uh, the crank. If you over-crank a camera, it makes everything go in slow motion when you play it back at normal speed because you're using more frames of the film at, than you need to at one point in time to capture motion. And so when you play that back, like if it's supposed to be 24 frames a second and you over-crank it to 48 frames a second, and then you play the 48 frame stuff back at 24, and everything's slow motion, and it's half the speed. Okay. Well, they say that the, the moon has one-sixth the gravity of Earth. All right. Now, again, NASA also claims that the moon is hollow. That every time they slam anything against the moon, it rings like a bell. That's, that's NASA's phrase. So the gravity of, of the moon would be pretty unknown to us because it requires us to know its bowels. We have to know what the moon is completely made out of. What if the moon had a solid uranium center? Then the moon would have so much gravity, it'd be insane. Now, of course, we do know that uh, it orbits Earth, and so we can make some guesstimates about 
how big Earth is, how, you know, we know what Earth's gravitational force is, and so we can guess back and forth, but it's just a guess. But one-sixth gravity, which is what they've certified now due to the moon missions, would make them move way different than they moved in that footage. It wouldn't be the speed that we saw. Now, the speed that we saw was double a normal camera crank. Because when you take all the moon footage, you can download a clip from NASA of astronauts on the moon during Apollo 11. Stick with Apollo 11 because it's the best. They made all the mistakes on 11. But if you take that, put it in a QuickTime view or any movie viewer you have, and you hit 2x playback, which is in every player on planet Earth, right? You'll start seeing everything look completely normal. All the dust flying off their feet settles down perfectly normal. 2x is exactly how fast they overcrank the camera on the sets of the moon mission. The other thing I want to put in as a footnote is are that my friends who have been doing this for more than 20 years have looked at all the stuff I'm, I'm mentioning to you and that I will mention to you, and they absolutely 100% know that this footage is fake because they create footage inside computers constantly, which is 100% accurate to the way light behaves, the way gravity behaves. They know about cameras. I've got friends in their 70s and 60s who made most of the science fiction movies that you've seen, including Star Wars, Tron, Blade Runner, all these movies that you saw. I, they know all of the tricks of the in-camera in optics, the optical printers that do all kinds of wild stuff. They know this stuff, and they know it's fake. Multiple light sources, etc. My young friends in their 20s who are making some of the most state-of-the-art uh, footage on television and film and video games, they count the light sources in seconds. They go, oh yeah, that's got at least five lights on it. Well, on the moon, there's only one light source, folks. Consequently, they're not so butthurt about the fact that we didn't go. <clears throat> they just roll their eyes and go, well, yeah, it's the government. What do you expect? You know, and if you're coming in from the government side of things... This whole thing is under undermining the trust that we have in our country and our space programs. It's huge. We just need to admit we didn't go and then go. Let's do it, man. Let's stop lying about going to Mars. Mars is uh, is merely a, uh, a mechanism to really put it out of sight, out of mind, because we couldn't possibly fake going to the moon right now because everyone has you know, optics in their backyards. They could actually watch the vehicles land. But there were video cameras up there, right? They were video cameras on Apollo 11. All right. One thing that's never been done in all the missions to the moon was taking the video camera and pointing it at Earth. Live. Just I'm filming everyone on the moon and turning it to the, to the Earth and taking a photograph of Earth in the video camera live and panning it back to the moon. You've seen fake photographs of the earth composited into some landscape of the moon, but it's fake. It's done by high-altitude planes using fisheye lens, uh, optics, perhaps satellites, and it's all composited into one shot. Brilliantly done, man. Brilliantly done. The other thing I've seen as, as evidence, which is not really evidence, it may be evidence, but it, it may not be, is that they'll take the photographs of the moon and of that shot of the moon surface and Earth in the background floating in space as kind of a half moon, which I'll explain why that's a problem in just a second. And they turn up the contrast in Photoshop, the brightness and the contrast, and what they end up seeing is this square artifact around this half moon shape. And they say, looky there, that is proof that this particular photograph was spliced into the original photograph in a square, and therefore it's a hoax. Now, that might be true, but let me educate you on CMYK JPEG compression. A JPEG is probably one of the shittiest image formats you could possibly save your photographs into because every single time you save it into a JPEG, you have a form of compression. Even if you're in Photoshop and you put it on 12, which says it's lossless, it is not lossless. It is losing your pixel data. A JPEG uses uh, CMYK color registry, not RGB. What it is doing in the compression algorithm is it is guessing pixels of data in your photograph. And the compression is based on a square that you choose in the compression itself. So if you do a compression at 2, 
uh, it would be extremely compressed and look horrible. If you did it 12, uh, the boxes get really tiny and it looks pretty much down there exactly the same way you, you saw it originally. But the problem is, is that NASA stores things and features things on websites and JPEGs. And so it's been highly compressed. Usually it's about 50% compression. Without getting into too much detail, it's, um, it's the same compression algorithms they used to use in DVDs. So they still use them in DVDs. Back in the 80s when DVDs came out, they said if you have a scratch in your DVD, what's happening since it's digital data is that if we're missing a, a, a particular note in the music, we'll use the previous note and the note after it to guess what that note would be in between. You can't hear the difference. It's really brilliant. So they've been doing that in images for a long, long time, whereas they are storing the light wave data, which is what's happening inside of a JPEG, instead of a RGB colored palette number in a big num in a big color palette of 16 million p potential colors depending on the bit depth of your image they're storing light wave information and so what happens is is they based on compression will intentionally skip pixels of color data and guess the difference and that makes the image smaller and it's accurate you can still see what it is so if you take a half moon shape in a black field of, of image data and you compress it at all, it is going to start hitting those pixels of the um, this half moon shape and it'll start creating a box around it, but that's really just the compression algorithm doing its thing. Because it works in box chunks, you'll get extra box data around an object that doesn't take the shape of a box. So you might be looking at evidence, you might not. There, there are fairly compelling photographs of the moon's surface without the Earth in it. When you turn up the contrast, you can sort of see the set in the background. That may actually be 100% legit because the architecture of a room is pretty evident in some of the photographs, and that wouldn't be indicative of any compression algorithm in any format whatsoever, right? But one of them that... Uh, one of the pieces of evidence that is, people think is a smoking gun, again, it lets them sleep at night is this idea that the astronauts dropped off a mirror. There's a photograph of it. it. Looks like moon dust, and then there's this really cool mirror. Couple things, all right? We have been bouncing lasers off of the moon prior to going to the moon. Okay. So the idea that someone can hit the moon with a laser and it bounces back to Earth, and therefore we have a triangulation capability, it has been done before we had this mirror. It takes universities a very long time to find the part of the moon that will reflect back to Earth. The moon is reflective. That's why it's white. And you can get lasers to reflect back photons, supposedly. But now I want you to think about the theory, okay, of having a tiny reflector, and this thing is not that big. You can make it six foot square, which it was not. I think it's about uh, 24 inches square. You're stationary on Earth. You are rotating at 1,000 miles per hour. The moon is rotating around the Earth. It's, uh, it's also kind of in a geocentric uh, supposed orbit where it's the one face that we see our, uh, forever is the only face we ever see, which is a whole other theory. I'm going to probably end up doing an episode on the moon separately. Even with the most intense, accurate laser, you have distortion of the atmosphere, you have two bodies rotating, one around each other, one around their own uh, center. The idea that you could ever get the laser to pop back is as astronomically against as you could possibly imagine. You would get it for a microsecond, right? Light travels 11 inches in a microsecond. That's how fast a microsecond is. But perhaps that's all you need. But it's not a smoking gun that we ever were there. All right? It's a nice idea. Now, the other piece of evidence that's sort of a smoking gun that we didn't go was that the sets were reused. I can't remember exactly which uh, missions match which missions, but you have two different missions where the landscape, the immediate landscape in camera and the, the background landscape were exactly the same. You can overlap photographs, and the only thing they did was add rocks to the second use of the set to make it look different. Now, NASA claims, okay, NASA's, NASA's correction and claim to, the, to fix this anomaly in the evidence against the moon missions was that 
that the astronauts landed downwind several hundred miles away from the the previous mission and that the mountains are still in the landscape and the background exactly the same because hey you know that's what happens you know you can be looking at the rocky mountains for a hundred miles while you're driving towards the rocky mountains and they don't really change right well they do change because the earth is curved right for some of us right only problem is is that the moon is really curved okay it is small as hell and if you're 100 miles back from any one particular point, the landscape's going to look way different. Those mountains would be way down if you're 100 miles back and way up if you're 100 miles closer. It's just a fact. But your immediate landscape would not be identical is the problem. And so the immediate landscape is your smoking gun that these are the same sets being used over and over again. Now, why they wouldn't try to change the sets, I don't know. It's just like government anything, right? Efficiency is, is not in their vocabulary. That would be efficient to use two sets or one set over again. But the problem is, is it's obviously revealing the hoax itself. Now, there's, a, there's one thing that's constantly mentioned. It's not really that far-fetched for me personally, but there is the, uh, the film, the video of the lunar module on the lunar lander, the top part, that blasts off and goes back into space, and there's a camera that tracks it as it goes up into, up into space. Now, their contingency is that it's being remote controlled from Earth, which is not possible, in my opinion, but could also be simply a timed uh, broadcast to the camera to make it happen. Who knows? Could be a, a wire that goes out to the camera, and as soon as the, you know, the, the engines, the little kind of uh, dynamite engine that pushed it off also sends a signal electrical signal out to the camera to start the pan and it just was all timed out perfectly that is certainly not beyond the capability of our scientists in the 60s to pull that off so for me i don't lean on that as a bunch of evidence but a lot of folks go well who was controlling the camera hey maybe that's perfect evidence that it was a hoax but i i don't buy that certainly uh as as proof but now some people say, well, shit, man, we brought back moon rocks. Uh-huh, we sure did. Well, let's look at what moon rocks would have to physically prove about themselves to be considered moon rocks. One, the moon rocks have disappeared. You don't get to see them anymore. They're supposedly moon rocks inside these glass containers, and so you're not allowed to get close to them. You're certainly not allowed to take a piece off of them and test them. Especially the big ones, right? 500, 600 pounds of moon rocks came back? Sure, sure. Consequently, a moon rock was donated, I believe, by either Neil or Buzz to an ambassador of Russia. I think in the country of England or something like this. I've heard this story change a couple times, but they did check it out and it was petrified forest rock. Now, some of you might just laugh and go, yeah, that's just us fucking the Russians. But, it, you know, it's a pretty dangerous, stupid thing to do. So moon rocks, let's think about this. One, there's a lot more photographs of rocks that claim to be moon rocks than rocks that we, that we have personally been able to ever analyze. So you could just have a prop, a rock that's from some exotic place on Earth. You, you hit it with sand blasters and make it look weird. You might even add a few um, paint elements made out of you know chrome or something to make it look crazy. Who knows? Faking a moon rock appearance-wise is extremely easy. You've seen it a hundred times on Star Trek before we ever went to the moon. Okay. But of the ones that were supposedly donated, maybe even studied, there's a little anomaly going on. Just prior to going to the moon, uh, we had several expeditions to the South Pole, the Antarctica. And they were looking for meteors. Now, for those of you who don't have any familiarity with this, the meteors that fall out of the sky at 100 million per minute. Okay, most of them are so tiny they just burn up. But they're all over desert floors. The Egyptians found so many meteorites of pure iron that they were actually able to make all their embalming tools out of meteorites. So if you take the embalming tools of Egypt and you study their radioactive frequencies, they're not from Earth. So you could say, oh my God, they're all aliens. No, they just made them out of rock from space. 
But NASA funded a bunch of expeditions to Antarctica before these moon missions to pick up rocks that are usually black in snow. It's a very easy place to pluck these things out of the surface of the Earth. At that point, you have a bunch of rocks that will register that they're from another planet. Why we would hand off a petrified forest rock, I have no idea. Everyone has a petrified forest somewhere in their country, typically, if it's at any magnitude, especially like Russia. Every continent has them, I guess you could say. So those aren't smoking guns either. So you might ask, well, how did the astronauts run around on the moon in the first place? Well, there's a lot of incredible evidence that has been picked apart by special effects teams in the UK first, who I believe made their videos in the uh, late 90s. But you'll notice that all the footage of astronauts on the moon's surface lack any stars. This is an old trick from theater for hundreds of years prior to going to the moon when actors wanted to fly in fictitious stories on stage in the 1700s, 1800s, etc., they realized that if you paint the back of the stage black and you put actors on black wires controlled by pulley systems and human beings in the wings, you can make them fly. And because the black wire blends in with the black background, you know, you can kind of tell the physics isn't right, like an Ang Lee movie, right? But it's a clever way of doing it. Now, I have personally downloaded footage from NASA and stopped every single frame and watched an anomaly perpendicular to the astronaut's body straight into the black sky. I even did a high con image of it. It's actually, I think, posted on the either the MK Ultra page or the Deep Thoughts page on Facebook. Deep Thoughts Radio. But now they tell you you can't see stars either in any of the photographs of, of Earth submitted by all the space agencies for the last 60 years. And you can't see any stars in space on the moon. In fact, Michael Collins says he couldn't see them. Hilarious. Now, if you study lumens and the science of lumens, which means the, the unit of measurement of light, which I am an expert in, you will know that the moon has visibility at a certain number of lumens. But there are stars that have more lumens than the moon. And Sirius is one of them. There are several stars that have the same lumens as the moon in general. There should have been some, there should be stars around Earth, no matter how you adjust an aperture, unless the, unless the sun is, um, excuse me, unless the Earth is pure white because they really screwed up the exposure. But as long as you can see the Earth and all of its glory in space, there will be stars that punch through. Not, not the 1200 you can see with your naked eye at night, there, but there would be something. But now, why didn't they attempt to make stars in the fake moon footage? Because the geometry of projecting stars on the inside of a warehouse would be impossible to keep accurate, especially in the late 60s. It would be very tough to do that today without CG. So they didn't attempt it, and they blamed it on the aperture of the camera. That's why you don't see any stars. Plus, if you had uh, some simulation of stars going on inside the warehouse and all these astronauts are on wires, then the wires would eventually cover up the stars and the stars would all blink in unison with the astronaut passing underneath the stars. Now, for those of you who have a problem with the idea that the astronauts are on wires, there are a number of recorded public evidence videos of astronauts in these uh, missions, these Apollo missions to the moon, where an astronaut has fallen over and they're trying to do this sort of like reverse kip up thing where they're pushing on their hands, pushing on their feet, pushing on their hands to try to get up. And an astronaut runs across the landscape to try to help his buddy get up and prior to the astronaut who's going to help touching the other guy, the dude who's hoisting the one that's fallen down pulls too soon. Before the hand touches his buddy, He's able to correct himself without any attempt to do so. And that's a smoking gun that they are on wires. Again, if you high con all the negatives of astronauts moving around on the moon in Photoshop, you will see this stuff. And again, I think NASA's hip to this and is most likely post-processed and reprocessed this stuff. So you would have to find NASA footage on someone else's mirrored website prior to modification to actually see what I saw. Now, there's also something that gets confused and that there's a six-inch antenna fixed to the environmental suit 
system that it gets confused with being a wire. The wire will be perpendicular to the surface of the moon, not parallel with the astronaut's body. So any wire that you see that's parallel with the astronaut's body is probably the antenna. I think it's on the uh, left shoulder of the astronaut. But now there's something very interesting about how they run around on the moon. They run around on the moon, and when they do so, and they kick up dirt, a lot of times the dirt flies away from the astronaut's feet, tangent to the curve of the surface of the Earth, or surface of the moon. So they stand up, and where you would see normally a plume, you know, that comes up from their feet and falls down at one-sixth gravity, you see it fire off, again, tangent to the curve of the moon at incredibly rapid rates. The fairly believable theory of this whole thing is that you have a set with astronauts or actors running around inside these astronaut suits. Well, wouldn't you think that'd be pretty hot? They can't possibly carry the over 100-pound environmental pack on their back and have all this versatility with 1-6 gravity because they're on Earth. And so those things have to be empty. And so you have guys sweating to death inside these, these outfits. So how would you keep them from overheating? You know, anyone who's ever been a character in a costume at a theme park will tell you how hot it is to be in these things, especially with up to five massive lights that we can deduce out of all the hot spots and all the photographs. So they're getting baked with theater lights. And so you do what they did in the movie Exorcist and you chill the set down such that everyone can see everyone's breath. But the nice thing is, is these guys are inside suits. So you chill the set down to potentially 40 degrees, just above zero, right? Just above freezing, I mean. And you blast them with fans. Not enough to move the, you know, the native soil by itself, but as soon as soil becomes freed up by a footstep, it gets hit by the fan and blasts far away from their feet. I believe that's 100% accurate. Now, one of the other smoking guns is the flag. Now, you will hear the most insanely stupid stuff from NASA when it comes to the flag footage. So America went up there, and just like in every other land grab in, in history, a flag was shoved in the ground, right? It's the American flag. Now, very, very few seconds of this footage has ever been broadcast to the public, but the problem is, is it was put in archives and people were able to get copies of this stuff before anyone doubted the fact that, w that we went. So we have minutes and minutes of the flag footage. And the flag is waving in the wind of these fans. That's why it's waving. And it's violent. Now for those of you who are still believing we went to the moon, you're pissed off. Go get a piece of uh, 3D rendering software. Uh, go get Blender 3D. It's free. Then go on YouTube and find yourself a tutorial about how to make cloth flags wave in the wind. In fact, just watch that, uh, watch a tutorial of that, and you'll start to see how much you're going to have to control physics, wind shear, all that stuff to get a, to get the simulation of a flag on the moon. And what's really funny is they try to tell you that in a vacuum of space, okay, that. Just touching the pole sends a kinetic wave of transfer into the pole that shakes into cloth and makes it shake. That shakes the, the, the rod that was put at the top of the flag to keep it stiff and, and hanging out beautifully, right? You've, you have absolutely no knowledge of physics if you believe that that's actually remotely possible. But they prey on your ignorance of such in science to make you believe such a thing. And let's, uh, let's give you all a little bit of homework to test this out. And you won't have to do the homework. You can just listen to my voice and go, oh, yeah, it's bullshit. Go up to your bed. Go up to a hanging sheet in, in the, uh, the backyard of your house as you're hanging it out to dry and, and punch the edge of your sheet. Punch the edge of your sheet and tell me how much the transverse wave that you have kinetically transferred into the fabric travels across that sheet. Punch the side of your bed uh, bedspread and tell me how much of the transverse wave makes it across the cloth. You know, shake and wiggle the cloth on a, on a table that's your tablecloth and tell me how much it affects the rest of the table. 
cloth does not transfer transfer transverse waves for shit. It doesn't happen. So the idea that physics is going to magically work differently in a vacuum is complete horseshit. That flag waving in the wind is waving in the wind because the fans that are cooling off these astronauts who are, or these actors are boiling to death inside, right, is hitting the flag. And that's why it's flipping all around the place. There's also a famous shot, a still shot, of an astronaut, I believe it's a still, of an astronaut having put the flag in the ground at a particular time of day at a particular GPS coordinate on the moon's surface, and the Earth is beautifully in the shot just above the flag. And there are nerdy ast- uh, astronomers, okay, that have f- put the time of 1960-whatever, 1970-whatever, I believe it's in the 70s, and they roll back time, and they put the camera right at the GPS coordinate of where this flag is because it is absolutely recorded in history as being right there. And they point the camera up at the angle that they say Earth is at, and Earth isn't in the shot. Again, when they were faking this stuff, they had no idea the Internet was coming. They had no idea how much power to the people we would have. And they probably thought, well, screw it. Eventually, I'm going to die, and who cares? They'll find out it was fake. That's what we need to be doing right now. We need to be just admitting that we didn't go. All these old dudes are gone. They're long gone. Everyone who participated in that thing could either say, I was part of the shadow group that did it, or I'm part of the public that thought we were doing it for real. But then America would be a liar, and NASA would be a liar, and by proxy, maybe GPL would be a liar, and the hoax of the moon, of Mars mission would be definitely exposed, and all this traveling to other planets, traveling to moons, would all be exposed, right? The game of selling pictures, because that's all they've done is they've sold you a story with some pictures to inspire you, and there's a bunch of business guys that make money. But think about it. We developed a tremendous amount of technology in this process. Technology that, you know, helps us out in our living rooms and technology that helps us eventually reach the stars, if they do exist, right? Now, some people, okay, so they'll, they'll lean on the end of the emission and they'll say, okay, we saw the capsule fall out of the sky and three big parachutes and land in the ocean and everyone got out, right? So what? So what? They pushed the thing out of the back of a C-130 equivalent to the time. And parachutes immediately deploy. The astronauts just feel a little bit of a, of a bump. But the parachutes pop out. They land. They're okay. No big deal. Now, a recent piece of evidence came out that the astronauts actually went to Hawaii for a couple weeks um, after the moon missions, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, now, the press conference after the Apollo 11 mission, the very first mission to say they went to the moon and dropped someone off and came back safely, unless you're absolutely, positively, massively delusional, this is one of the smoking guns of the whole thing. You have Buzz Aldrin on the right, Neil Armstrong in the middle, and Michael Collins to the left. If any of you have ever seen a human being after they've cried you will know that the the flesh in the face is very flush. There are telltale signs in the swelling of the face. And usually there's a demeanor of a human being after such an event has taken place. Because either there there is a faux, jovial, uh, you know, rebound going on, or someone is still fairly somber as a result of whatever made them emotional in the first place, right? You can test your judge of character and your ability to read a human being by watching this press conference. You have three guys who are utterly and completely terrified of the consequences of being involved with such a hoax. They did not want to be a part of the hoax. I guarantee it. None of those men, two of which have passed. I will remind you, Michael Collins uh, was rumored to have told all of his friends that he was going to blow the whistle on the 40th anniversary of the moon missions. And uh, he ceremoniously died in a motorcycle accident in Ojai, California, just prior to the anniversary coming around. Neil Armstrong gave a very interesting speech at the White House, I believe, where he uh, revealed, I think, encoded talking about the secrets and the truths that will be uncovered and eventually tell everybody that we didn't go. 
but they are walking on eggshells in this entire interview. When they asked if they saw stars, they all got really nervous. And Michael Collins, in fact, they all got really quiet. And Michael Collins steps in and says, well, I don't remember seeing any stars while we were out there. Now, with his naked eye, he would have seen the stars. Okay, everyone would have seen the stars with their naked eye. doesn't matter how reflective the moon surface is. They would have seen stars, at least Sirius and all the big boys, right? Michael Collins later wrote in his book how many stars he actually saw. He said he saw a ton of stars. Hmm, interesting change there. Right after it happened, he can't remember what happened, but many years later, 30 years later, when he could make money off of a book, he saw tons of stars. But they're all on guard, all of them. They're answering as slow as they possibly can. And I think that's because they were good men. Buzz is still alive, right? Buzz was approached by the independent movie director Bart Sebrel. Bart is uh, Bart's a maverick, and so he he doesn't take shit from anyone. And I think that people don't like that about him, and so they tend to dismiss his amazing journey into the moon hoax because he took this attitude. Now, Bart, again, I I said it in my previous episodes. He bothers me because he blames the astronauts, and, I, and I, I think that Bart has never been threatened by intelligence agencies, that their pensions will be removed, that their families will be threatened or hurt. He's never had that happen, to my knowledge, at least by the time he was filming this stuff, and so I think that his assertion that they should be the ones to blow the whistle is, is really unfair. But he showed Buzz Aldrin the footage that I mentioned way back at the beginning of this episode of them faking the portal shots inside the, the lunar capsule. And Buzz absolutely lost his shit. Buzz um, was doing a book signing. Uh, Bart showed him, I guess, some credentials. He was from the Discovery Channel because Bart was doing work for the Discovery Channel. So he used his credentials to get this post-interview behind the scenes. And they're back in some office of the bookstore. And Buzz is just packing up his stuff. And he says, I want to show you a videotape and get your comments. And so he shows them this videotape of them unequivocally faking the shots of, of Earth in reverse order with a gel on the window with a red light inside the capsule to create enough light so they could see what they were doing. And Buzz absolutely loses it. And it comes within a micron of admitting that they didn't go to the moon. But what he did say was, well, how did you get this footage? And why don't you talk to NASA? We're just the passengers. He says that over and over again. Neither one of those sentences, neither one of those replies, which you can watch on YouTube, are indicative of having gone to the moon. If you went to the moon, you wouldn't ask, well, how'd you get this footage? Why would you ask that question? Well, that's the footage we took. We went to the moon. I think you've misunderstood this, that, and the other thing, but we definitely went. He didn't say that. He said, where did you get this footage? How did you get this footage? And then he says, you need to talk to NASA. We were just the passengers. It's an amazing clarification of his position in this whole thing. And I think a very heartfelt statement that Bart should have backed off. Bart should have been nice to the guy. Instead, he pursues him outside after that with the Holy Bible. And he says, put your hand on the Bible and swear you went to the moon. And Buzz punches him in the face. And for those people who need to keep this facade going, they revel in the fact that Buzz punched him in the face. Now, I might take a little bit of uh, Buzz's side as well and say, Bart, you're being very rude to a man who was a victim. It's almost like going up to a person who was raped and saying, why did you get raped? Why did, why did you get raped? Why didn't you tell the whole world that you got raped? You know, it's not the victim's fault. And so, for me, him saying that he was just the passenger is to say, look, this wasn't my idea. I was forced to be the passenger on this flight. It was dangerous. It was dangerous physically going up there and maybe something could have gone wrong. It was dangerous if I were to ever reveal it. And think about this, okay? Every astronaut that participated in the hoax, they live a completely different life for the rest of their life, and it goes like this. They have to watch everything they say for the rest of their life. Think about that. 
Imagine you had a lie that you had to hang on to. And as you lose your mind over time, you are having a problem remembering the lie because the brain is starting to give way. Buzz Aldrin has said on live television, and you can't find this by itself anymore because they have chased it off of YouTube, but it's embedded in certain subclips. I have not been able to find the clip. My smoke shop just watched it a couple months ago and said, oh yeah, we just watched that. And I'm like, go back in your history. Please find that for me because I need to show it to my listeners. But he said, live on television, once we figure out how to go to the moon, we'll, we'll have a lot better knowledge about how to get to Mars. And it stunned everyone on this news program going, what, what do you mean? And he repeated it. And they said he was tired and stuff. No, he's getting old, man. It's hard to hang on, hang on to all the details of the lie. Now, some of the other, the one piece of evidence I want to bring up is Bart Siebel's second film called Astronauts Gone Wild, which again is a stupid name for a great documentary. Bart went out and interviewed all of the astronauts that were, that he could get his hands on and had them describe in detail the whole mission. But he asked one really amazing question that they differed on tremendously. Now we know exactly physically what would have taken place because we just know. But they asked him when the booster rocket was firing underneath the lunar lander, the 10,000 pound thrust engine, which doesn't have enough room to actually have the engine in there, doesn't have enough room for the fuel tank. They said, uh, did you hear anything? What was it like inside? Was it loud? Was it quiet? One of the astronauts said, no, because there's no sound in space. There was no sound. And the other astronaut said, oh my God, it was deafening. Well, okay, in an oxygenated cabin, uh, the cabin walls would be shaking like crazy. Again, there's no room for the engine. There's no room for the propellant. Okay, so this never took place. Just deal with it, okay? But it would be utterly deafening. It might even be so violent it would shake your body apart, you know. Uh, people don't know this, but when you get shot by a gun, if it's a high enough caliber, you can simply die due to the transverse shock wave of the bullet colliding with your bones, it just absolutely stops your nervous system for a split second and then turns back on, and by that time, you're dead. So there could be just a life-threatening amount of reverberation going through this vehicle, which would be probably a very rough ride. Anyone who's ever ridden in an intense sports car, you realize it beats you up as you drive it. Anyone who's really into low-profile tires and you try to drive on a highway that isn't great, it shakes you apart. Imagine that's a 10,000 pound thrust engine shaking the shit out of your body. But for me, that was the slam dunk proof that these guys are trying to hang on to a narrative, hang on to a story. And all their stories are fairly unified. They are trying to hang on to a bunch of the technical details about the mission. They have this rehearsed story that they go into. Now, there was the Stanley Kubrick admission that he participated in the filming of Apollo 11 and the creation of the fictional story of Apollo 13, which is that they, something mysteriously blew up on the outside of the modules as they were headed towards the moon, never ever explained by NASA once. And then, therefore, everyone was interested in the moon missions again because by Apollo 12, no one cared. All right? Sad, sad uh, narration about American citizens. But I believe wholeheartedly that Stanley Kubrick admitted on film 15 years ago that he participated in the moon missions, the filming. I do not believe for a second he wanted to participate in it, but he said it was his greatest work that he was never going to be able to admit to. Now, there was a bunch of... You can watch my special report on this to get an hour's worth of detail on it in season one. Just look up Stanley Kubrick in the uh, YouTube channel search for this channel. But I believe wholeheartedly that he admitted to this. I studied his face, his geometry, to make sure it was actually him. They released, again, same technique in 2000 with the, uh, the slipped out footage of the first step on the moon coming out and them doing a fake movie that somebody made as a hoax, which would have cost a tremendous amount of money for no real benefit financially. Then they say the director dies. They release a movie, I believe, called Stanley Kubrick. Or no, no, it's called Moonwalker. Right? It's a horrible movie that has Stanley Kubrick showing up to, to film the moon hoax. 
So they know this, they know this uh, footage is going to get slipped out to the public. They put the movie right on the back of it. I had even listeners telling me, oh, no, you're falling for the hoax of Moonwalker. That's disinfo guys right there or, or fairly gullible people. So when you see Stanley Kubrick admitting to the moon hoax, you need to look at the mole that's on his left cheek. And if you want to talk to uh, physicians about how moles grow over time, they typically have a, a fair amount of discoloration when you're younger. And the discoloration and pigment typically ceases to grow with the mole, and the mole continues to grow underneath it. And you'll start to have a, a bigger mole with a little dot on it, which is your original dis, uh, discoloration that caused the, the mole to exist in the first place. It's an anomaly in your skin tissue. But that's him with a slight uh, kind of New Yorker, Jewish accent. No one's ever claimed to be that actor. People have said that uh, Stanley Kubrick's wife denied it was her husband. Not true. She's a very public woman. She gives video interviews, and she's never said it wasn't her husband. <clears throat> but a brag in England said, oh, we, got, we contacted her, and she said it wasn't her husband. Bullshit. If anything, she's the reason why we know Kin Kissinger rented the set of 2001. Now, she might end up saying it's not her husband just to get rid of the uh, the focus on, on her family, but I don't know if there's any repercussions that could take place. Stanley's long dead, unfortunately. But it's never, ever been debunked properly. Ever. Just a bunch of claims. That's all people need anymore, right? Now, I've hit two hours now. Uh, regardless of what you see in the final edit, it's at two hours on my end. I know that there are a lot of tiny little pieces of evidence here and there. Please feel free to post them in the comments. Uh, let's link some videos on the bottom of this one, too. The Buzz Aldrin one's out there. I'll, I'll try to find it again. But it's out there. I've seen it with my own eyes, and all my close friends have seen it as well. There was a YouTube video eh, about 2005, which had a bunch of people that participated in the hoax. A bunch of old guys that couldn't give a shit anymore. And they, they explained how every shot was done with uh, front projection and rear projection. So, you know, they built big, gigantic replicas of the moon. They built them with uh, camera tracks um, attached to them. So NASA built enough props to fake every moon surface video you've ever seen as well. I mean, it is so absolutely easy to prove this thing is a hoax. The fact that we're hanging on to it really just exposes the psychosis of man's patriotism. It really does. You know, if you want to look at hot spots and photographs, there's one where Buzz Aldrin is walking down the staircase backwards from the lunar lander. There's a big hot spot on his heel. Uh, but the sun's completely on the other side of the lunar lander. He would have been pitch black with that extra light sources, especially with these cameras that were so cranked up you couldn't see a star. Give me a break. The hot spot on his foot wouldn't, wouldn't have existed. But I've actually sat down with folks that have gold trophies in their houses for special effects and I've said take a look at these photographs and just tell me how many light sources do you see and these guys have been in special effects for 20 years and they said oh well okay one two three four five five minimum five in this particular shot horrendous right my my uh, exiting thoughts to this whole thing go like this the only thing we need to do is stop the hoaxes moving forward this amazing push to go to Mars is nothing but a gigantic hoax. The reason why a bunch of Mars movies have been greenlit is to pioneer in the public sector all the special effects techniques to actually make this mission possible so that, such that you can't discern reality from CG stuff, right? The beautiful thing about it is that you now have all the evidence right in front of your face about what's going on here. Again, if we had ever been to the moon, and we, if we had the technology to go to Mars, we would absolutely test it on the moon. That would be a basic, basic thing. You know, if Disneyland was going to build a water park, for instance, and they were going to re-engineer wave machines and slides and all that technology that we have at all the water parks, if they were going to completely bake that from scratch, they'll make tiny simulations of it for 10 people and test it. Maybe even little tiny models and test it. They would not build the whole thing from scratch and hope it works. That's too much of a risk, especially when you have lives at stake. If you need evidence that the space agencies are lying to you, I want you to go search on YouTube. Or sorry, search on Google. 
for every single photograph claimed to be a picture of Earth from space. Every single photograph. And as you find each photograph, it's not, you know, a CG replicant, right? It, it needs to be from NASA, needs to be from the Japanese space uh, programs, the British ones, the European ones, the Chinese ones, and the Russian ones. Take them all down onto your hard drive and then open them up in a collage so that you can see them all at the same time and tell me that those photographs are real. If we had been to the moon 47 years ago, we would have crystal clear, perfect photographs of Earth, and they would all match regardless of what space agency took the photograph. Because Earth is Earth is Earth, right? I think you feel me. I hope this was satisfying to those who wanted to have a, an extra deep dive into the evidence. I know I missed stuff, but I'm just winging it here. So hopefully I got to the, the bigger pieces there. I'll try to put photographs in this particular episode, but it does slow down editing considerably. But I think this is kind of important and fun. If you like the episode, please like. If you like the series, please subscribe. Your comments are absolutely welcome. I almost want to say mandatory. Give me some give me some feeling here for what you're feeling about this whole thing. So take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.